closely follow the most important facts around the world with a wholesome view. We offer you to be where the news are happening with our team of 25 correspondents deployed around the globe. Live and experience the realities of our people from the South. Monday to Friday, just in Telesur, our North is the South. U.S. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump have been met with protests in Puerto Rico as they arrived for a brief meeting with victims of Hurricane Maria and the first responders working on the ground. Hurricane Maria caused havoc on the island. Many residents are frustrated and resentful because they are still struggling with the lack of electricity aid and, I mean, basic necessities two weeks after the storm. Trump continues to face widespread criticism for his handling of the storm in Puerto Rico. He had called the Puerto Rican officials ungrateful, nasty, and guilty of poor leadership. Our correspondent Eduardo Martinez from Puerto Rico with more on Trump's visit. Eduardo? From San Juan, Puerto Rico. Donald Trump's visit has provoked anger from different sectors of the island's population, expressing that the U.S. president is only visiting the island just to be photographed without any sincere intentions to actually help and work in the recovery and reconstruction of this country which is still reeling from the effects of Hurricane Maria. Independence and anti-colonialist movements in Puerto Rico have expressed that they are pursuing an agenda to reject the U.S. aid that has been slow and ineffective. On the other hand, they are also demanding that Puerto Rico's government, along with the government of the United States, allows deliveries of aid from other Latin American countries who have offered their help in the recovery and reconstruction efforts. Countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic and Panama have expressed their willingness to send humanitarian aid. But the cabotage laws and the Jones law forbids them from helping affected communities by not allowing them to deliver aid to the territory. Up until now, only 45% of the population have access to drinking water, and just 5% have access to electricity, while there is still the need for food and drinking water. This is the situation here in Puerto Rico. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Eduardo Martinez from Puerto Rico. More news in a minute. Stay with us. Ecuador Vice President Jorge Glass has been taken to jail in Quito after a court order his preventive detention on Monday. The Supreme Court ordered that Glass be jailed on suspicion of accepting bribes as part of the Odebrecht corruption scheme, where Odebrecht officials allegedly paid 33 million to Ecuadorian officials. The Vice President says that the order is a shameful abuse against him, but he will comply because he trusts that justice will prevail. Glass insists there is no evidence of the alleged crime and says that he will appeal the court of ruling to international organizations. Earlier, supporters of Glass protested in the streets in Guayaquil. 
Let us ask President Lenin Moreno, who, after eating at the same table as Jorge Glass, has stabbed him in the back. We ask him why he arrived in town and came to win. Why? Thanks to Correa and thanks to Jorge Glass. Jorge Glass. And the president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, has presented seven key questions for a plebiscite he announced in mid-September. Five of the seven questions involve direct reforms to the constitution passed in 2008. Moreno said highlighting the issues through a popular consultation will have helped uh, government work more efficiently and strengthen the country's democracy. One of the key issues the referendum plans to tackle is the elimination of indefinite presidential re-election by making changes to the constitution. This more, some 97% Chileans who voted in a non-Biden referendum last weekend favor replacing the country's private pension system, according to the national coordinator of a No to AFP, the civil society organization that organized the poll. They say the current system is constitutionally flawed in its origins. Under the system, pensioners are required to deposit uh, their retirement savings in individual accounts managed by privately operated pension fund administrators known as AFPs. According to Chilean authorities, Mapuche activist Ariel Trangol has ended his hunger strike after 118 days. Trangol was the last of four activists to end a hunger strike in protest at charges under Chile's anti-terrorism law. He and his three brothers, Benito, Pablo, and Alfredo, are accused of leading an arson attack and burning an evangelical church in 2016 in the town of Padre de las Casas. They say they are innocent. The Mapuche activists have been in prison for a year and four months, but have not been found guilty or tried. Colombia's Congress has held a public hearing on the implementation of the peace agreements between the FARC and government. Various groups expressed their concern over the delays and breaches of some aspects of the peace deal. We have this report. Ten months after the signing of the peace accords, only 18% of what was agreed has been implemented. A study has shown that the Colombian state has not compiled nor assisted with the former combatants or with the communities that are still waiting for the real result from the peace process. We have found serious difficulties and problems with the implementation of the peace agreement. One of them is the situation here in Congress where there's a big issue with the legislative implementation of the agreements. Only 18% of the agreements have been discussed and adopted to develop these peace agreements. The social and economic rights of the communities who have lived through the armed conflict are among those policies being ignored. There is still no regulation for the agrarian development and there are serious problems regarding the substitution of illicit crops as the government continues to move forward with the eradication process. There is also a lack of judicial, physical and social economic security for the former fighters. The physical security is the one that has to do with the guarantee law, the special unit from the Attorney General's office to prosecute paramilitarism and such, in which none of the pilot programs have really started, even when they were promised many months ago from the government. The National Pact to Eliminate Arms from Politics hasn't started yet either, when there's eight months left for the presidential and Congress elections. Recently, the Peace Agreement Implementation Observatory warned that the breach of the peace accord seems to be a strategy in which powerful forces from within the state and various political movements are aligned against the process. But the government reiterates that the delays are due to the normal procedures under democracy. All this implies is that the speed of the implementation of the peace process is down to democracy. Every initiative needs to be discussed. Every constitutional reform process needs to have its time in Congress. We have to listen to opinions, observations, and those who are critics. And we also have control according to judicial power, in this case, the constitutional court. The landscape of Colombia 10 months after the peace agreement is concerning. In the reintegration zones and with the training of the former guerrillas, 
The guarantees promised by the government are nowhere to be seen. These guarantees aren't visible even in Congress. Several sectors in the country have denounced Congress, saying that they have tried to transform the peace agreements to benefit other people and their motives. What's more concerning for us is for them to pretend to change the content of the agreement, because that will drive the peace process into failure, and we don't want that. In the midst of fears about the little progress with the implementation of the peace accords on Monday, the House and Senate spoke again about the law which will regulate the special peace jurisdiction. 141 human rights organizations and victims called on members of Congress to effectively respond to the special law. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. The U.S. State Department is expelling 15 diplomats from the Cuban embassy in Washington, D.C. According to the State Department, it is because of Cuba's failure to take appropriate steps over what it calls health attacks against its embassy staff in Havana. In August, the department said that U.S. embassy staff and five Canadians in the Cuban capital experienced unusual audio disturbances. Cuba has repeatedly said it has never and would never tolerate attacks on foreign diplomats on its soil. The Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez is expected to speak on this decision shortly. Las Vegas police say that 23 weapons were found in the hotel room at the Mandalay Bay where Stephen Paddock killed himself. 64-year-old Paddock was named as the gunman who opened fire on 22,000 revelers, killing at least 55, 59, I mean, people on Monday. Police have obtained a search warrant for Paddock's house. The shooting has been described as Metro the deadliest in recent U.S. history. Much of Catalonia has come to a halt as 40 trade unions called the general strike. Thousands of people gather in front of police stations across the region to denounce the violent repression at voting stations during Sunday's referendum on independence for Catalonia. Schools and public buildings remain closed. The Catalan government approved a goes law allowing 25% of public transport to keep running. Basically, we are demonstrating because of the violence that we, Catalans, suffered on October 1st, the referendum day, a violence which was unjustified. The PP and the words of Mariano saying that the referendum didn't happen, that this reaction from the police was an exemplary and measured reaction. I don't know if he has seen the images. I don't know what world he lives in. Please stay with us. We will be back very soon. I told you, Las Vegas police say that 23 weapons were found in the hotel room at the Mandalay Bay where Stephen Paddock killed himself. Our correspondent, Alina Duarte, is in Vegas. She joins us live from there. Alina?
Hello, we are here in Las Vegas, Nevada, in one of the hospitals that has received most of the people that were injured during the last Sunday night attack made by this white man called Stephen Craig Paddock. Uh, uh, it was the worst mass shooting in modern American history. This man, described as a long gun man, killed at least 59 people and injured more than 500 others that were attending a concert, a country festival below Paddock that he was 64 years old of Mesquite, Nevada, fired shot after shot from his room at Mandala Bay Resort and Casino down on the crowd of about 22 million people, sent it uh, Terrified concert goers running from uh, their lives. Investigators found 23 firearms in Paddock's room at Mandala Bay Resort and 19 more at his home. President Donald Trump will visit Las Vegas here on, on Wednesday. He called the shooting an act of pure evil. Uh, the debate today in the U.S. revolves around the need for the regulation of counts uh, to avoid another tragedy. Thank you, Alina, Alina Duarte from Las Vegas. Much of Catalonia has come to a halt as 40 trade unions called the general strike. We were uh, speaking on that too. So our correspondent, Juan ortiz Azara joins us live from Barcelona. Juan, what is the situation with the general strike right now? So we can say that this journey, this strike, well, it's not a strike, a stoppage, uh, worked because there was no violence uh, during the stoppage. There were a lot of demonstrations in the whole Catalan territory. People were excited and the demonstrations were done to reject the policies of the government of Rajoy during the last referendum. No. This, as I was saying, there was no, there was no violence, and the the country, the region was paralyzed. And the difference between the the strike and the stoppage is a technical difference because the, the strike means that people that don't go to work have a salary uh, day uh, the, the salary the day is discounted but when we talked about stoppage well people continue receiving the, the salary that day of salary but does uh, a strategic stoppage what authority have said and the minister of economy said that those officials that didn't go to work will have that they discounted from their salaries and this is uh, the there are now confrontations between Madrid and Barcelona well actually it's better the governor the Spanish government and the Catalan government they say the Spanish government say that they had to use that force because the Catalan officials didn't uh, try to stop the referendum. However, they say that violence was unnecessary by the police officers. We also are waiting from the European Parliament because tomorrow in the European there will be a debate on the Catalan issue. However, they will, they will discuss the situation, but from Europe, European authorities say that it is an internal issue from Spain, but the Catalan authorities say that it is an European issue, and there's also the possibility of the application of the Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution. Well, it, it's about the, the autonomy, in this case of the Catalan autonomy. The Senate says that they are prepared to approve these, these issues. 
Joan, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joan Ortiz Isera from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. State uh, Department is spelling 15 diplomats from the Cuban Embassy in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Let's go live to Washington, D.C. with our correspondent Jorge Gestoso for the latest. Jorge, what's the background to this case? Well, um, definitely, Dre, the most um, compelling uh, statement has been done by the State Department, and it says regarding that decision, and I quote, this move does not signal a change of policy or determination of responsibility for the attacks on the U.S. government personnel. We are maintaining diplomatic relations with Havana, the decision on expulsions, was taken due to Cuban's inability to protect our diplomats in Havana as well as to ensure equity in the impact of our respective operations. And basically the background is that the U.S. is alleging that uh, the U.S. diplomatic personnel in Havana has suffered from some um, medical issues. They say that, for example, uh, they, they have suffered a string of attacks on some staff members, and they, they mentioned that left injuries such as hearing loss and traumatic brain injuries. And, uh, and therefore, they are asking all the non-essential personnel in the, in the diplomatic embassy in Havana to come to the U.S. as soon as the end of this week. And uh, they want to reduce exactly the same amount of uh, personnel uh, in the uh, Cuban embassy here in Washington as in the uh, U.S. embassy in uh, Havana. We're talking about 60% of reduction. We're talking about 15 members, as you mentioned, here in Washington. And there was more than half in Havana, Ray. Thank you, Jorge. We must pay close attention to Mr. Bruno Rodriguez's words very soon. Thank you. And now the Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Alhamdulillah has held a unity cabinet meeting in Gaza for the first time since 2014. This is part of a reconciliation effort between Hamas and Fatah. Hamas announced last week that it was handing over administrative control of the Gaza Strip to a unity government headed by Rami Alhamdulillah, who is based in the West Bank. Our Gaza correspondent Noor Harazin has more on the ground. Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah arrived in the Gaza Strip on Monday in a part of a two days visit to the Gaza Strip to reconciliate with uh, Fatah's rival party, uh, Hamas. Today is the second day of this visit. The Palestinian people here are happy and excited. They do believe that uh, 10 years of Palestinian division will end in these uh, few weeks. Uh, Hamas does expect much to come from this uh, reconciliation project, like uh, Fatah could uh, release a number of uh, political prisoners in the PA jails. Abbas could lift his sanctions that he imposed on the Gaza Strip and many good things could happen like opening the borders and also the problems of electricity, water and medical supplies could be fixed. Thank you, Noor. And here's a roundup of news from around the world. Hindus fleeing the violence in Myanmar have been speaking out against persecution. The recent upsurge in violence over the border in Myanmar has seen government forces persecute the minority Rohingya Muslims. However, other non-Muslim minorities, such as the country's small Hindu population, have also been affected. Some of them have fled to Bangladesh, joining the estimated 500,000 people who have fled the latest violence. They slaughtered Hindu people. For seven days, we were completely surrounded and cordoned off there. When they went to burn another area, that is when we managed to escape. We had to cross a river, a canal, and all this while my children were hungry and asking for milk and rice. I could only give them water. Later, when I arrived in Bangladesh, I asked where the Hindu people were staying, and this is how I ended up here. People across the Korean peninsula have been celebrating National Foundation Day, which marks the founding of the ancient Korean state by its legendary founder, Tangun.
North Korean officials held a memorial service at a tomb believed to be that of Tangun, which was allegedly discovered in 1993. The celebrations come at a time of heightened tension between Pyongyang and Washington, along with its allies in South Korea. Germans are celebrating 27 years since reunification with large festivities alongside a tight security presence. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said that the day was one of peace and joy. However, she also reiterated the challenges that lie ahead. Following recent elections which saw the far-right anti-Islam party Alternative for Germany, or AFD, enter parliament for the first time. We know that we have plenty of problems yet to solve, that building a just and strong country relies fundamentally on our economic prosperity. We know we have big challenges ahead, bringing states and regions more in line with one another, that we have responsibility for Europe, that we can be grateful for the fact that reunification has been peaceful and successful. And right now, here in Rhineland Palatinate, we recognize what violent conflict has done. So Germany does not only carry the responsibility of peace within its own borders, but also the whole of Europe in an ever-improving world, because we know we cannot simply disconnect from international events, and instead we must care about them. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for Monday's twin bomb blast in the Syrian capital of Damascus, which claimed the lives of 17 people. The group released a statement on their own news channel, Amak, which laid claim to the attack in the al Madan neighbourhood. The attack was the first in the capital since July and comes as the Syrian government has been making important territorial gains against the group. An estimated 17 people have been killed in clashes between security forces and separatist protesters in Cameroon's Anglophone regions. Tensions have been on the rise after a year of state repression in the majority French-speaking nation. The anti-government protests in the English-speaking regions have given Cameroon's president, Paul Bihar, one of the biggest challenges he has faced in 35 years in power. We've come to the end of this news brief. These and many other news, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Ray Gomez. Thank you for watching. We are where the news are happening. That's why Telesur have deployed a team in the Caribbean to give you three special emissions of From the South. With our anchor Ray Gomez from Caracas and our correspondents Regan Desvignes from Dominica and Natalia Margarita from Antigua and Barbuda. Follow the updates of the situation after today.